Hi guys, it's Dylan from Chess Lifestyle. The intro to this video was not completely random, and I promise it'll make much more sense as the video continues. Let me tell you a little story, boys and girls, about how Dylan turned Michael into an Endgame fanatic. Just kidding, Michael already loved Endgames, but uh, now he loves him even more. And that's because of this game that I'm about to show you, um, which uh, we used in one of our training sessions. So I hope that it's as entertaining, inspirational, and uh, interesting for you as it was for us. Quick note before we dive into Smyslav. I know Michael said that the next uh, video we bring to you was going to be of live coverage of the Lindora's Abbey Rapid Challenge, uh, but we changed our minds because you know that's just our prerogative. But we did find an interesting and exciting game that we do still want to share with you from round one, so you can expect that next week. Vasily Smyslav was born in Russia in 1921, and although he lived most of his life in the shadow of Mikhail Botvinnik, uh, he was undoubtedly one of the greatest uh, positional masters of the mid 20th century and of all time. And he was also um, an Endgame Virtuoso, which is the namesake of his book, Vasily Smyslov Endgame Virtuoso, which incidentally Michael and I are going to be using in our training sessions um, in the near future. So a link to that in the description. Vasily Smyslov uh, was able to claim the world championship title in 1957 against Mikhail Bovinik and uh, then went on to uh, lose the rematch in 58. Even at the ripe old age of 62, he played in the 1983 candidates cycle, uh, making it to the finals, only losing to one Gary Kasparov, who went on to win that world championship match against uh, Anatoly Karpov. Smyslav had a huge effect on uh, a lot of players, uh, including uh, Kramnik, who said, Smyslav was a brilliant endgame player and his game sometimes looked like songs. When I look through his games, there's an impression of easiness, as though his hand made the moves by itself, and Smyslav didn't strain himself at all, drinking coffee or reading a newspaper. Almost a Mozart-like easiness. No strain, no tension, everything is simple but brilliant. That's why I like Smyslav and his games. Also, you can't tell me this dude don't look like the Noam Chomsky of chess. Throughout this game, I'm going to be sneaking in several other um, quotes by and about Smyslav. So without further ado, uh, let's dive right into the game. I will play 40 good moves, and if you can do the same, the game will be drawn. So this is a quote by Smyslav, which I think is emblematic of his straightforward and highly psychological style of play, uh, which we're going to see examples of in this game. Uh, this is between Smyslav with the white pieces and Samuel Rusevsky, very strong American grandmaster with black pieces. And it was played in the World Championship Candidate Cycle in 1948. I do want to preface this by saying that while a lot of the explanations I give in this game will be relatively simplistic in the spirit of Smyslav's elegant, straightforward play style, I, I do strongly believe that this game is uh, very valuable for players of all strengths to see. And this has to do with um, a pretty surprising, counterintuitive, and um, inspirational idea that helps um, Smyslav transition from middle game to his highly coveted end game. So let's get into it. We got e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and we have um, the Roy Lopez after bishop e5, the oldest opening there is. Both players develop naturally towards the center. And after c3, d4, white has achieved the central pawn duo, where if black ever captures with the pawn on d4, we can recapture with the c-pawn, maintaining the central pawn duo. So both sides continue to develop um, naturally. White puts some pressure on this weak f7 square. Black responds to that by um, preventing white's knight from coming into g5, adding more fuel. Oops adding more fuel to f7. Knight d2, and now knight g6. And one thing we can say about the position of this knight in particular, in black's position, is that it's not on, on its traditional square of f6, from which it would uh, control d5 and e4. Um, what it is doing is that it's eyeing this um, sometimes weak f4 square but uh, since it's not controlling this d5 square, this leads Smyslov to um, start fantasizing about how to maximize one of his pieces, particularly this, this knight on d2. So Smyslov wants to bring the knight from d2 to c4, 
to e3 to d5. And by doing so, he's going to maximize the position of this knight. And that is step one in how to play like Smyslov. Maximize the position of your pieces. And this may look like a long-winded maneuver, but white's actually going to be able to achieve this in relatively short order, and at no cost to his position since it's uh, still closed. So knight c4, we start with the maneuver. Both sides castle, and we continue with the maneuver, knight e3. And after bishop f6, which uh, puts some pressure on the long diagonal, Smyslov just goes ahead and plunks his knight into d5, and already he's achieved this ideal square for the knight, which will translate effectively into a lasting positional advantage and um, something black's going to have to deal with for the rest of the game in one way or another. After rook e8, black actually has a threat of playing d takes e4, uh, sorry, e takes d4, followed by uh, rook takes e4, which is currently undefended. So white has to defend that pawn. White has to react to this threat. <clears throat> he could just defend the pawn with uh, rook e1 or queen c2. Uh, both are decent moves. But Smyslov just goes ahead and captures on e e5, which in effect sort of um, encourages trades, which he is a, quite fond of. So after bishop takes e5, Knight takes e5. If one of the knights were to take on e5, Smyslav would just play f4, which would start a kingside attack uh, with an initiative and an advantage. So black doesn't do that. Black captures with the pawn instead. Now Smyslav just develops his queen to a, an active square. Very simple. And uh, it should be noted that there's a lot of pressure on this f7 square now. So black has to do something about that. He decided to, um, to negate the pressure on f7 while also uh, sort of threatening to maybe remove this knight on d5, after which maybe he would be able to breathe a little bit easier in the position. But this brings me to step two of how to play like Smyslov, which is to reinforce your maximally placed pieces. Um, by doing so, after this capture, capture. Um, now we've retained a piece on this uh, square that we've worked so hard to garner for ourselves, and it comes with tempo. So now after queen e7, Smyslav finds this pesky move queen f5, which at first glance may look like it's just sort of an improving move, but um, it actually contains a threat. So if black plays something you know, without thinking too much, rook a to d8, perhaps. Uh, pause your video, if you'd like, and try to spot the tactical resource that now white has at his disposal. So congratulations if you were able to find bishop takes h6, because now if uh, pawn captures bishop, we just exchange the rooks, and we're able to take on g6 because of the pin on f7. Okay, so black doesn't um, play rook a to d8, and instead he just retreats his knight, which sidesteps some of those tactics. And after bishop e3, very natural developing move, black plays knight e6, which may appear at first glance as if black has maneuvered this knight to a more beneficial square, but in fact, it's actually uh, disrupting the vision of some of his major pieces. And it's also just sort of not going anywhere. Um, what's this knight's future? I'm not sure there is much of one. Play proceeds with white just bringing his last piece into the game and threatening to play rook d7. Black has to do something about that, and he tries desperately to negate the influence of these rooks on the dag or on the uh, d file. Um, it should be noted here that white should not take on d8 because after some after a line like takes takes takes, um, black can just take with the queen, and this relieves a lot of the pressure on his position. It may uh, appear at first glance as if uh, white can just win a pawn here, but uh, black does have this back rank checkmate. So instead of trading. This brings me to step three on how to play like Smyslav, which is to prepare for the endgame. G3. So this prepares 
uh, eventually to play h4, which would create this uh, very common pawn structure for an endgame, which is very strong. Not only does it do that, but it also asks a very difficult psychological question to black, which is, um, what are you actually doing in this position? And the answer is, uh, not much. The truth is, these minor pieces are really just floating here in the center of the board uh, without any real destination. If black were tried to try to uh, relieve some of the pressure on the d-file by capturing, then that would be met with a vicious fork and one of the knights would fall. So this move is um, sort of just a statement by Smyslav saying that I have a complete domination of the position and now you must choose how to react. And uh, Ryshevsky didn't, uh, didn't react very well because he played uh, knight d6. And this brings me to the fourth uh, step of our how to play like Smyslav manual, which is to create a weakness. And so after uh, rook takes d6, pawn takes d6, we now have this backwards d6 pawn to bite at for the rest of the game. Okay. Queen g4 was played the threat of uh, capturing on h6 due to the pin on g7. And black sidesteps that with king h8. Now bishop b6, controlling a lot of the dark squares on the queen side. And it might seem at first glance as if the main point of this move is to disallow the rook from coming to the defense of this d pawn, which is true, but it also has a much more subtle plan in mind, which we're going to see shortly. So rook b, uh, sorry, knight b8, possibly uh, remaneuvering itself to f6 with the tempo on the bishop. But we're going to see this is too little too late. Uh, and here, uh, the sequence of moves that's about to be played had a great effect on myself as well as Michael. And you might be surprised to know that uh, white is just a few moves away from being able to effectively end the game. So pause the game if you would like to try to play like Smyslav the end game virtuoso, and find how he was able to force his opponent into submission here. So Smyslav started with uh, bishop e6, which pretty much forces f takes e6. If queen takes f6, we just trade the queens and we take on d6, and all uh, black's pawns are falling. The game is pretty much over. So black has to avoid a queen trade at all costs, which is going to be a vital factor in the resulting positions after f takes e6. And the amazing move, queen h4. Yeah, this move pretty much won my heart because it's so counter counterintuitive because uh, after a queen trade, this pawn is still under threat and there's no way to defend it. So we're just going to be able to win some material. And despite our weakened structure, we're going to be able to uh, convert. So that's why black cannot allow this queen trade. Queen b7. And now white goes ahead and insists on the queen trade. Um, this forks the queen and king, so the queen trade is forced. And again, this pawn is going to be gobbled up. Okay, so random interjection from the future. Um, Post recording, I felt as if I hadn't done proper justice to this queen h4 idea uh, in terms of expressing just how counterintuitive and brilliant this move actually was and how well it encapsulates Smyslov's style. Um, so forgive the uh, script, but I felt it necessary to organize my thoughts this way. Uh, so Smyslov was a passive aggressive bully because he puts his opponent in positions where they must choose between sitting still or harming their own position. Uh, and when he foresees not only a favorable endgame position, uh, but even an equal one, as long as it's rich with potential to outplay his opponents, he bullies them into deciding whether to allow an endgame, which they know is Smyslov's turf, uh, or to make some concession to avoid it. And this is the kind of thing that leads his opponents to seek therapy afterwards. Uh, given this, it must be said that Smyslov was not only an endgame master, but a middle game master in the sense that he was able to consistently achieve the type of position that allows to him to subject his opponent to this type of psychological struggle. Returning to this queen h4 move is the kind of move that's so simple and even obvious in hindsight to the point where it's almost embarrassing that it came as a shock the first time around. Uh, but that's the great thing about Smyslov. He, um, he sheds light on the overlooked simplicity of the game, especially if the moves come with the merit of achieving the type of position you're comfortable in. 
Smyslov um, could have also targeted d6 via queen f3, queen d3, uh, and so on, but um, instead he prefers to first force an endgame. Um, the good news is that ideas like this will come much more naturally if you remember to ask yourself these questions when nearing an endgame. Who will be better in this endgame? Uh, and if it's you, uh, can you force the endgame? Uh, and trust me, every um, even very strong players need to hear this now and again. Um, the transition to the end game is a phase of the game that's um, very commonly neglected uh, at all levels. So anyway, back to the game. And this brings me to step five of our How to Play Like Smyslov manual, which is uh, to simplify into a winning end game, which Smyslov has achieved. Um, I'm going to zoom through some of these moves, but it should be clear that even at the expense of uh, our queenside pawns, we're going to gobble up all of the uh, central pawns, which will result in an endgame where uh, we have achieved our ideal kingside pawn structure, uh, as well as we have this strong e pawn against this um, past a pawn, which at first glance might look threatening, but um, black will have no way to promote this pawn, uh, but also no way to stop the promotion of this e pawn. And we're going to play some moves to demonstrate this. So we're going to show how the game actually continues. And and we have an exchange of the A pawn or the F pawn in this position, which is um, sadly something that Black had to go for. But now we still have this past E pawn, which is going to be um, lights out for Black. Here we're actually threatening um, to trade the rooks with rook a8. If, rook, if the rook trade is forced, then black is obviously winning, so that has to be um, sidestepped, so it is, with uh, king f8. Rook a8 anyway, king e7, king a7, and it was in this position that Ryshevsky decided to resign, because all of um, black's pawns will be falling. So I hope you enjoyed this game as much as I did. Um, I found it highly instructive example of how to effectively turn your opponents into a sitting duck while you uh, play very, very simply um, by maximizing your pieces, reinforcing them, uh, creating weaknesses, and simplifying um, into a winning endgame from there. Uh, easier said than done, of course, but um, yeah, Smyslov makes it look really easy, and that's what's really inspirational about him. Uh, I guess I'll finish with a quote by uh, Max Uwe, who said that he plays the same common moves you and I make, only he wins the game. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed Smyslov's Immortal Simplification. Take care. Bye.